Day, good noon, great dusk, and best dead of night, and welcome to another spectacular, sensational, and spellbinding episode of Spectroactive, a show in which I and a contingent of implausibly faddy enthusiasts attempt to assimilate, interpret, and clarify a vexing complex of technological conundrums. Together we shall go boldly where no binary bard has binned in our bid to decrypt the recurring quandaries presented by a malevolent digital dictatorship and cast indispensable logic over a confounding choice of exorbitant trends, before abruptly degenerating to a petty and pointless squabble over which merciless corporate kraken possesses the highest principles and the hottest hardware. At least, if the pilot was anything to go by. Joining us at this non-specific juncture in the space-time continuum, we have... Former Glubidart Ethernet fiddler turned New World Orchard Appellite, Colin Laundry. Compulsive component uh, hoarder... It's Colin Landry, actually. What's that? Colin Landry. We went through the whole of the first episode and you never corrected me. Are you sure this isn't a case of tomato-tomato? I am sure, and I'd sort of assume that you'd find out for yourself before inviting me back. Evidently my hopes were too high. Forgive me. Joining us at this non-specific juncture in the space-time continuum, we have former Glubidud Ethernet fiddler turned New World Orchard Appellite, Colon Landis, freelance PC Puritan and incorrigible component hoarder, Henry Holsworth, and gender amorphous AI morals and ethics alchemist, Dr. Laurie Haywood. Those who bravely endured our last loquacious conclave will have witnessed a somewhat vitriolic debate concerning the pros and cons of Mac pros and hack pros, all precipitated by an innocent listener's naive appeal for expert assistance. Uh, where's Waldo today? Uh, Waldo went. Went? Reverted to his preferred profession of posing behind a lectern, wearing a beige cardigan and being paid $10,000 an hour to convey the dangers of digitally autonomous socio-cultural constructs. It's quite phenomenal the wealth you can amass from a career in complaining. Isn't that kind of what we do on this show? Certainly not. We discuss, we argue, we debate, we even criticise, but we never complain. So, what's the difference between a critic and a complainer? A critic damns the art, a complainer damns the artist. Uh-huh. Is it possible to do only one? Of course. For some people, the presence of an underlying problem transcends all viable solutions, because to them, the problem itself represents the conclusive solution. The existence of flaws is their reason to exist. Sounds like you're describing a pessimist. I am, but it was the most logical thing I could think of without time to fully process the question. So would a complainer choose Apple or Microsoft? Aha, uh -huh. a contextual analogy, very clever. They'd choose whichever gave them the most to complain about. That'd be Microsoft, says the career Appleologist. Oh, not already. And what would a critic choose? Whichever gave them the least to criticise, before using it to criticise the other. Nah, that's just a fanboy. Or girl. Or perhaps a complainer would choose both and then utilize them to incite the prophecy that the entire tech industry is hell-bent on our short-term exploitation and long-term redundancy as a species. And that's exactly what Waldo does, and has done for over 40 years, within 30 books, all of which I'm told are Amazon bestsellers, so this autonomous autocracy seems to be serving him fairly well. I think that's unfair. If you read Digital Decadence, for example, it seems pretty clear that he's cautioning specific embodiments and implementations of AI as opposed to the entire concept of autonomous technology. Yes, yes. Well, at the risk of turning this show into yet another platform for Waldo's literary waffle, or rewriting a third of the Oxford Dictionary, I think we should turn to the topic at hand. Now, in the previous episode, one Robbie McLean of Salem in Oregon challenged our panel to appoint the perfect homebrew counterpart to Apple's long and desperately anticipated Mac Pro. Despite an acrimonious tete-a-tete -tete over the prohibitive perks of Apple's allegedly unique selling points between Messrs. Holsworth and Laundry, the diligent Dr. Hayward and presently AWOL Oakley each devised their own starkly contrasting hackintosh. 
All individual products and prices were divulged in intricate detail should any of our audience wish to empower or refresh their cortexes, but suffice it to say that Lorry's was bang for the budget, whilst Waldo's was bang to go bankrupt. Both, however, featured core components from the royal blue region of the gargantuan silicon divide, as indeed does the enigmatic cheese grater that inspired their composition. We concluded on a tantalising cliffhanger by posing the question of whether Waldo's wallet withering hack pro was more or less exorbitant than the mortgage no object thoroughbred which Colin inadvertently compiled via his perpetual interjections. Well, actually, I was just fact checking all of Henry's unfounded assertions, but if you want to put specs in my mouth, I guess that's your prerogative as an impartial moderator. Oh, uh, do we have an objection, Your Honor? No, not at all. Just setting the stage for those logging in late. Well, I won't be accused of bias. That's very much your department. So, in the interest of neutral part picking, I shall now assign you an empty shopping basket, a bottomless pocket, and a license to configure. And you better be quick, pal, or that Mac's going to be as obsolete as OS2. Uh, yet another example of non-Apple inferiority. Just get clicking, Colin. You'll remember that Waldo's quote totaled a decidedly thrifty $20,700. His complete spec is listed over there on the right, so it's your task to either equal or surpass its performance and value. I've already explained Mac OS alone is worth Apple's premium, let alone the peerless engineering, intuitive modularity, a massive scope for expansion. Your honeymoon with a Mac Pro will last its lifetime. Tie the knot with a Dell Precision workstation and you'll be screaming for a divorce right after that first magical Windows update. I think he's conceding already, folks. We all know where this is headed, so why don't you let me tie up those loose threads and we can knock off early? No, everyone shall have a fair crack at their Mac. Colin, kindly choose your chip. All right, the 28-core Xeon it is. Good. And well, I declare... $7,500, level pegging with Waldo so far. At least something's exempt from Apple tax. Motherboard will skip, since the sole option is Apple's in-house design. Right, with eight optimally spaced PCI Express slots, a proprietary locking mechanism, and integrated auxiliary power for the graphics cards. Just look at that interior. Cable management consigned to the annals of history. Want to upgrade, open up, pull out, push in, close, job done gotta be worth at least another grand. The audience shall adjudicate. Let's get on to memory. Waldo plumped for 192 gigs of registered crucial dims. I assume you'll want to retaliate in kind. Of course, but remember for Waldo, that's the maximum his motherboard will accommodate. Whereas I have another 1.3 terabytes of modular hospitality. Fancy a RAM drive, anybody? Note the faster frequency, too. 2933 versus 2666 megahertz. <laughs> but that hardly translates to a quantum leap in performance. Besides, the sticks that he selected also come in a package rated at 2933 megahertz, and 12 of those are exactly the same price. But he's still limited to 192 gigs. Yeah? for almost two-thirds less cash. Uh, pardon me, but I thought we'd already discussed that Apple officially sanctions self-sourcing and upgrading where memory is concerned, not to mention graphics cards, storage space, and peripherals like the Afterburner Accelerator. There are even videos on their YouTube support channel illustrating the procedure. Hmm, they keep conveniently quiet about it on their site, though. Just glance down that list. Every price massively inflated over its typical market value, with not a single link or even the slightest reference to more reasonable alternatives. And how about the iMac or iMac Pro? A remarkably similar scenario. Every single memory upgrade between double and triple the cost of identical products available from third-party e-tailers. Why do you think that is, Colin? Surely it couldn't be that they're brazenly playing their customers for suckers and plucking extortionate labor charges out of thin air, assuming they'll never be condemned for it. The information is just a couple of clicks away in the applicable support sections. Certain Macs are much trickier to upgrade than others. The iMac Pro needs to be completely disassembled to install extra RAM. There would be a serious risk of totaling your system if you didn't possess the requisite knowledge and skills. Which is why OWC, for example, offers packages inclusive of fitting by a qualified technician. 
all of which still undercut Apple's upgrades by almost 50%. Doesn't include shipping costs, and there's a three-day turnaround time. Some folks just want their machines forged at the factory and ready to rock right out of the box. In the case of the current iMac and iMac Pro, Apple respectively charges up to $705,000 over the odds for the painstaking task of either turning a screw or twisting a handle. It is beyond shameless. I kindly refer you to my earlier answer. Hmm. Well, this anomaly presents us with a dim dilemma. Do we restrict ourselves to the bounty on Apple's site? or allow Colin to harvest memory from farther afield. Uh, the configurator should govern the prices. Self-installation is clearly referenced on the site, hence any compatible solution should be permissible. Laurie, what do you think? <sighs> I'm just trying to think of something I care less about. Convivial as ever. So the casting vote resides with me, and my decision is... All vendors are viable. I can't abide by giving Colin any grounds to declare foul play after the fact. Do you honestly believe I care that much? As a matter of fact, I do. And there's no clearer evidence than every time you open your mouth. He shouldn't care. This'll all be academic once I've submitted my build. Uh, moving on to non-volatile recall. Waldo's dual 1TB Samsung 970 Evos weigh in at $400, but since the Mac Pro's boot drives are proprietary, you've got no third-party equaliser this time. So how exactly will you justify the 100% surcharge? Easy. The T2 security chip. It's not technically a part of the SSDs, but primarily relates to storage, and you certainly won't encounter that in any hacking tosh. Mm-hmm. Well, what's so special about it? It renders user-installed OS drive upgrades impossible and prevents non-Apple-ordained technicians from carrying out repairs unless they happen to have access to a special diagnostic utility supplied exclusively to Apple stores or authorized service providers that verifies certain replaced components are Apple-approved. Uh in addition to enabling hardware-level virus-proof data encryption, as the name suggests, and better still, accelerated video encoding within a range of popular applications via Apple's Video Toolbox. It's essentially like having Intel's Quick Sync in a system that wouldn't otherwise feature it, such as... Such as... Oh, let me see... That one over there? I'd say that's an extra $400 well spent. A salient point, and astutely argued... I've no doubt the T2's myriad talents shall be news to many, though whether they justify the overhead remains debatable. Let's proceed to the apple of my eye candy. What do you have to counter Waldo's Titanic RTX tag team? A pair of Radeon Pro Vega 2s, or a single and exceptionally dynamic duo. Time was when dual GPU cards often struggled to deliver double the brunt, but thanks to AMD's Infinity Fabric Link connecting the two GPUs, performance should be virtually identical to two separate Pro Vega 2s. But still way off Waldo's twin titans. Depends on the workload. The Radeon rules in double precision compute. It has 16 gigs more of RAM, a wider memory bus, broader bandwidth, and higher base and boost clocks. None of which translates into any practical advantage. The Titan trashes it in everything that matters. Gaming, video encoding, deep learning, 3D rendering. But it can't come close in cryptocurrency mining. And just wait till you get a big Navi-based successor. Trust me. That is destined to be another Mac Pro exclusive. By then, NVIDIA will have rolled out Ampere. What's this, Henry? Gone off AMD all of a sudden, have we? Your enemy's enemy's enemy is your friend when it comes to Apple. Delicately put. Back to the builds and I see that Pucker Mac now leads Pretend Mac by $1,600 in a head-to-head -head where smaller is certainly sweeter, but do remember... That figure only accounts for components we can attribute prices to. All others shall remain a mystery until the grand total. Though I fear Colin is about to compound his ballooning budget, because next up we come to the monitor, and before you ask, yes, I'll permit the purchase of a visa mount and an alternate stand. Great. That should leave just enough to tip the UPS driver. I won't bother reiterating why the XDR display is still a steal compared to that anemic Dell. 
There's enough professional videographers who eagerly corroborate my claim. Yeah, many of whom abandoned Apple after the trash can farce and have no intention of surrendering their creative liberties again. More unfounded propaganda. Excuse me, I have a question. Go ahead, Laurie. Can that XDR screen be used with non-Apple computers? Yes, yeah, but it if you be use the Gigabyte Titan Ridge Thunderbolt 3 card. Ah, one at a time, please. The answer is yes. I don't know the precise number of systems or methods to get it running, but if you were to hook two display ports on one of the RTX Titans and Waldo's build to the two mini display port inputs on his Gigabyte Titan Ridge AC card, then connect the Thunderbolt 3 output of the latter directly to the monitor, you'd get full 6K with 10 bit color depth. But good luck when trying to calibrate the picture because there are no physical controls on the chassis and all functional settings like contrast, dynamic ambient light adjustment, brightness and color gamut profiles can only be accessed via macOS's system preferences. Colin, is that true? You're asking the wrong person. I don't waste my time with hacking Tosh's. It is true. I'm sorry. I actually knew the answer already, but figured the show could use a dramatic twist, you know? Just to spice things up a little. Not sure about twists, but an injection of sarcasm might not go amiss. There is one. Well spotted. Then I'd say that's yet another solid reason to live with Apple's levy. Or just grab two Asus Pro art panels and enjoy equal quality with greater workspace. Excuse me, just to be clear, Mac Pro customers have a wholly unrestricted choice of display, whereas Hack Pro builders cannot fully utilize the XDR monitor. Oh, Colin, are you imploring that I spare you the extravagance of that pixel-perfect panel after all? Apple never intended for it to be essential. Why do you think they leave an opt-out in the configurator? Well, this is certainly brutalizing my meticulous bookkeeping. Speaking of which, aren't you sick of accounting software that's run perfectly for the last 20 years, allowed you to organize your personal finances with no internet connection, and file your annual tax returns in a timely fashion with no need to sign up, log in, or incur a monthly fee? Then you really ought to treat yourself to the life-changing experience that is online accounting, a veritable masterclass in wheel reinvention, and countless new problems derived from formerly perfect solutions. Upload every precious nugget of your private financial data to remote servers hosted in foreign countries owned by competing companies you never needed to rely on before, all maintained and supervised by people you haven't met and would probably think twice before sharing a lift, Uber or elevator with, and who would likely feel exactly the same way about you. Be constantly pestered with monthly updates, impeded by superfluous features, and reminded that yet another subscription of $9.99 a month is due to expire. Royalties, bonuses, windfalls, mortgages, bills, loans, debts, that bathrobe that you submitted as office expenditure, along with all your dodgy rounding, shall be the best kept secret of profitable businesses who guarantee your confidentiality, unless their security is compromised by hackers or they go bust and have to cut their losses by selling it all as an asset. Cook your books in the cloud, where no one's watching, because you have nothing interesting to hide. Do you? Was that a sponsor or a public service broadcast? That was a critical parody too enlightening to be buried in a YouTube comment section. Uh, due to time constraints and this community's voracious appetite for fresh content, it became necessary to divide the second instalment of Spectro Active into several logical partitions. Accordingly, this message denotes the conclusion of episode 2A, and, depending on the time of your kind viewership, Episodes 2B and 2C will be available to savour either immediately or within a reasonable period, by which is meant before the applicable material is rendered irrelevant by the tides of technological evolution. Should you happen to be watching this video, say, more than a year after it was created, the above has likely already occurred. In which case, please kindly continue to enjoy it from a historical perspective, since many of the products discussed might actually be affordable in your present tense, and what true technophile would forfeit the chance to fulfil their fondest silicon fantasy?